Thank you, choir and musicians. Thank you guys for uh, coming tonight. Um, looking forward to what the Lord has for us. So always a privilege to share the word of God with you. Uh, let me pray for us one more time as we get started. Lord, you are kind and merciful and good. And uh, we confess, Lord, daily our own inadequacy, our own insufficiency. Lord, to, um, Lord, to be the people, Lord, we know that you desire us to be. Yet at the same time, Lord, we look to you, knowing that Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our sufficiency. He is our hope and our joy and our peace. So, Lord, we serve you every day, not in attempts to earn your favor because you already love us infinitely in a way that can't be shaken or lost. Rather, Lord, we serve you out of the overflow of love that you've poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has changed us. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us day by day walk in the fullness of the Spirit, serving you and magnifying your name in all that we do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, if you have a Bible, you could turn to Acts chapter 17, although it's going to be a while till we get there. Um, Tonight I'm going to be talking on the the subject of what is evangelism. So it's just going to be very introductory, but hopefully a a little bit helpful to you. Uh, A poll was taken some years ago, and it's probably a little little old now, I'm sure. But uh, it was asking people what their greatest fears were. What their greatest fears were. Can anyone guess what number one was? No, close though. Mm -mm. People's greatest fears, people in general. Greatest fears, come on. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope. (laughs) Nope, but that's probably up there. When I tell you, you're going to be like, oh. (laughs) No, no. Anybody else? What is it? You know. What's the, what's the scariest thing? Snakes. Snakes. The number one thing that people were afraid of was snakes. <laughs> You're terrified of snakes. I figured that would be the first thing you said. Uh, number two is public speaking. Number two is public speaking. And I think that's what intimidates a lot of people when it comes to evangelism. People think of sharing the gospel as kind of like a, a pitch, kind of like a presentation. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to kind of talk about that, and maybe we can kind of think about that in a different way. I mean, it is a proclamation. There's no doubt about that. But uh, there are ways that we can do it that are not going to feel like we're just unloading on someone, so to speak. But when lots of people think of sharing the gospel, they think first of a presentation. And since that is the number two fear of all people, apparently, then um, that can be problematic for, for people when we talk about evangelism. You know, when we talk about evangelism, some people think of the guy in the corner uh, preaching hellfire and brimstone. I've seen some of them guys before. And um, some people think of doors slammed in their faces. Some people think of... You know, you're talking with someone, and then they just start slowly, awkwardly, like, backing away from you, you know, not wanting to be get too close to this, this person. Um, but, you know, what if evangelism doesn't have to be that way? What if you could own your faith and speak of your faith as naturally as you would about your kids or your family or the ball game? Or the weather? What if people 
aren't nearly as terrified or unwilling to talk about spiritual things as you think. Um, I think all, I think that's true. I think we'd be surprised. I've always been surprised how open people are to talking about these things if we're willing to uh, uh, initiate. But before we get to talk about what evangelism is, first I want to talk about what evangelism isn't. And that's important because we don't want to um, think we're doing evangelism when in fact we're not. First of all, evangelism is not merely doing good deeds. Good deeds adorn our witness, and they are vitally important. And a lot of people today are, um, I think, overcorrecting from an imbalance of the past, you know, where uh, evangelism was so in your face and so impersonal that people have overreacted and just, um, you know, have have changed it into just, well, just love your neighbor, love your community, do nice things for people, that kind of thing. Well, that's fine, and we should do those things. We're called to do those things by Jesus Christ, but it's not evangelism. Jesus in Matthew 5, 16 said, let your light shine before others so that people may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Well, to me, it's, it's impossible to see, to me, how you can do a good deed for someone but never say a word about Jesus and yet them give glory for what you've done for them to God. It seems to me that unless your good deeds are accompanied by an explanation of why you're doing what you're doing in the name of Jesus Christ, only then can they give glory to God uh, who is in heaven. You know, there's a very famous quote that's sometimes associated with evangelism that's, um, I guess, attributed, I don't know if he really said it or not, from St. Francis of Assisi. It says, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. You know, it's a, it's a, a nice little quip, but it's just inaccurate. If you told the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul, preach the gospel when necess- uh, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. He would. I mean, I don't know if he'd punch you, but you know, he would. He would. He would lay. He would lay into you like he laid into Peter and say, "What are you talking about? The gospel is words. The gospel is the good news that God has come to redeem sinners. You can't." It would be really hard to communicate that by just doing good deeds. You have to explain to people what it is. You have to tell people what the good news is. You, can, you must speak or you're not doing evangelism. So he's, the quote rightly says that our actions should adorn the gospel. Our actions should be so self-sacrificing that it... It portrays in our lives what Christ has done for them. And in that way, we do share the gospel with our lives. The the Apostle Paul and the other apostles, just about nearly every one of them, uh, died martyrs' death for their testimony that Christ has risen from the dead. So their lives, and, and Paul endured great suffering in going out to all the places that he did to tell people about Christ. He endured great suffering, and in Paul's suffering, people saw Christ's suffering. In in his willingness to suffer so that they may know Christ, they get a glimpse of what Christ's suffering for them was like when he verbally shares the gospel with them. So So our lives should adorn the gospel, but it is not enough unless we open our mouths and speak. The gospel means good news, and news must be told. Romans 10, 14 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Evangelism does not take place unless we are verbally sharing with people about who Jesus is, what he has done, and what our response is to be. So the first thing evangelism is not, 
Uh, it's just not just doing good deeds. Second thing is evangelism is not. Evangelism is not spiritual mugging. <laughs> okay? It's not, it is not backing someone into a corner till they pray the sinner's prayer, and then you can check another box on your church roll or something like that. Okay? Evangelism is not spiritual mugging. It is not being arrogant, nor is it being a jerk. It is not manipulation of people's minds or emotions. That's important. When we share the gospel, I think, in fact, we do want to touch people's emotions. We want to convey the truth of the gospel in a way that uh, is appropriate to the gravity of what we proclaim. So, when you talk about heaven, you should be full of joy and try to help them see the joy that heaven is. When you talk about hell, you should be heavy-hearted and you should have tears in your eyes. And you should make it clear, we should never talk about hell in such a way that, we're, that we give the sense to other people that we want them to go there. Some people talk about hell like that. If you can't talk about hell with a... With, with, a, with, a, with a broken voice, if you can talk about it with a straight face, you don't understand what you're talking about. You don't want anybody to go there. And so we must talk in a way that is appropriate to the gravity of what we're talking about, but we're not trying to manipulate people. Jesus let people walk away. Jesus told people, you better count the cost before you try to follow me. He didn't just, he didn't just, I mean, he didn't just, you know, uh, make a, say, oh, just affiliate yourself with me. He didn't just, he didn't just go about saying, I want you, I want as many people to just be affiliated with Jesus. He wasn't trying to start a movement to make his name popular. He was trying to create disciples. And so he didn't just come to try to get the maximum number of people that he could to just uh, bear his name, so to speak, by mere affiliation. He wanted people who, in Jesus' words, would take up their cross daily, die to self, and follow him. And Jesus said, if you're not willing to do that, you can't, you can't come. And so he wasn't, and so we can't, we can't just try to manipulate people or try to let people Come in, so to speak, any which way possible, but we need to explain clearly what the gospel is and explain clearly what it entails and let them make a careful, weighed decision on the matter. Because it's no small matter. Jesus in Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 33 said, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not... While the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus is saying, when you come to me for who I am, namely the creator, sustainer, author, and perfecter, the Lord of the universe... You are renouncing all, any claim that you had to your life. And you are saying, whatever Jesus Christ asks me to do, whatever price he asks me to pay, wherever he tells me to go, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pay it. I'm going to go there. And so Jesus says, you need to count the cost before you come to me. Because if you start and don't finish, people are going to mock you. In other words, you, need, you don't want to start Christianity and not finish. You need to be aware of what it is and think carefully about it before you come. So evangelism is not 
uh, merely doing good works. It's not spiritual mugging. Finally, evangelism is not seeing people get converted. Evangelism is not seeing people get converted. Let me explain. Conversion is not the same thing as evangelism. Evangelism is sharing the gospel by urging people to believe in Christ for who he is. Evangelism is proclamation, not salvation. Why is this important? Because some people think that if they share the go- if if they if they're sharing with people and no one gets saved that they're not doing evangelism. That's that's not true. That's not true. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. You proclaim the gospel to people, but you can't save people. Salvation is beyond your pay grade. God saves people. You don't save people. You proclaim and you be obedient and you do the evangelism and God will take care of the saving. So evangelism is necessary for conversion, but it's not the same thing as conversion. You can evangelize and never see any converts, but that doesn't mean you're not evangelizing, and it doesn't mean you're not being faithful. But nevertheless, we have the calling and the commission of God to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, so think about this. The prophet Isaiah was commissioned by God to, pro, to proclaim God's word to the Israelites. Do you know what God told Isaiah when he commissioned him? Do you remember? This is what he said would happen to Isaiah. He said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant. And houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose seed remains, whose stump remains when it's felled, the holy seed is its stump. Do you want that kind of commission? God told Isaiah, go proclaim my word to Israel, and guess what? No one's going to listen. What did Isaiah do? He proclaimed the word of God. But we have a better word from that. We have a better word. Jesus Christ said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, I am Lord of all. Therefore, you have the power to go and make disciples of all nations. And what what does it mean? It means when you go and proclaim the gospel, people are going to get saved. Not everyone will, but some will. Some will hear. Some will listen. Some will believe. The famous Baptist missionary, William Carey, preached the gospel for seven years in India before he saw his first convert. The same was true of Adoniram Judson in Burma. Our calling is not to convert people, but to proclaim the gospel and let God do the converting. But here's the thing. When we faithfully proclaim the gospel, God, God will save people. There's just no doubt about it. He will. So what is evangelism? So evangelism is not merely doing good works. It is not spiritual mugging. It's not conversion. So what is it? Very simply, it's this. Evangelism is sharing the good news of Jesus with the lost and urging them to believe. Sharing, with, sharing the good news of Jesus with the lost and urging them to believe. Let me explain it through a couple of biblical analogies. The first biblical analogy is that of the former. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For you are God's fellow workers. You are God, for, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. The gospel, Paul says, and Jesus says, is like farming. You sow the seed. That's it. That's it. You just sow. The farmer goes out. He sows the seed. The farmer, what the farmer doesn't do is he opens his bag of seed and he looks at each individual kernel and says, that one's going to grow. This one's not going to grow. Throw it out. That one's going to. You don't know. You don't know which one's going to sprout. You don't know which one's going to bear fruit. You just sow it. You just sow it and you, you sow it and you water it, but you can't make it grow. God has to make it grow. God gives the growth. We are not responsible for how or when particular seeds sprout, only that we're faithful and that we've watered it. Another thing about this example, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We never know what the Lord is doing in someone's life. Lots of times the ministry that God gives us is sowing. And the ministry that God gives someone else is watering. And the ministry that God gives someone else is harvesting. But you just never know where you are. So you may, you may be sharing the love of Christ with someone. And, it, and, it, and you may walk away and you may say, that person is never going to get saved. You don't know that. You don't know what the Lord's doing. You don't know what God's plan is. Or, or there's been numerous times where I've talked to people and someone else has talked to them or they heard something on the radio. Or you just never know and they've been thinking about it. <laughs> and you come in and you enter into what the Lord is already doing. And you just had no idea and you would have never guessed it. So you're watering. And then sometimes they're ready. And they harvest, and you harvest, and, and in other words, the time comes and they believe. And so you never know whether you're, you're just sowing or watering or what. You never know what it will be. You just proclaim. So the Bible says we're farmers. It also says, with regards to evangelism, that we are fishers. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, when you fish... What do you do? You cast your hook, right? But you, you cast your hook, but you can't make the fish bite, all right? But here's the thing. You'll never catch a... Every, every time... You can testify. You don't catch fish every time you go fishing. <laughs> but let me tell you something. If you never go fishing, you'll never catch a fish. And when it comes to evangelism, lots of times we're like, well, I don't know all the answers. And, you know, and what if they ask me something I don't know, I don't know the answer to? And, and, you know, what if they're mean? And all this stuff will look. You, you look at those guys on the, on the TV and they got their, you know, uh, $10,000 fishing pole and other fancy rods. And all this super techniques and stuff. And you think, well, I'm not like that. I'm not that kind of fisherman. Listen, untold numbers of fish have been caught by hot dogs and white bread. Okay, that's just a fact. Look, you just proclaim. You just cast the hook. You let God do You just throw in the net. You let God deal with it. Okay, you don't have to. There's no such thing as a professional Christian. Professional anything. We just cast in the hook. We just sow the seed. And we let God take care of it. So what is evangelism? It is sharing the good news of Jesus with the lost and urging them to believe. And so tonight, uh, in the remainder of my time, I just want to go over the good news. When, it, when we say sharing the good news with the lost and urging them to believe... I want us to be clear on what the good news is. In other words, I want you to feel comfortable enough with what 
our message is as Christians so that you can share it in a clear way. And there's, I think, an easy way, I think, that's helpful to remember this. And there's, there's all different kinds of ways to do it and to share it. But a good way to just remember it is, is four things. God, man, Christ, response. God, man, Christ, response. Everybody say it with me. God, man, Christ, response. That's, that's it. It's simple. And I, I asked you to turn to Acts 17. This is Paul's proclamation to the Athenians of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is pretty much the clearest example that we have of Paul preaching the gospel to people who have no Christian, no Jewish, they had no Jewish background. They didn't know anything about the Bible, which is becoming increasingly true today in the world that we live in. And this is how Paul explains the gospel to these people who, had, who knew very little, if anything at all, about the true God. And it's in Acts chapter 17. I'm going to read the whole passage from 22 to verse 34. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects... Let me stop right there. As I read this, I want you to pay attention to how what Paul explains about God, man, Christ's response. Think about how he explains those things in this passage. God, man, Christ's response. He says, I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I, I also found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, that God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life, gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he has judged the world on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead now when some heard of the resurrection of the dead some some mocked but others said we will hear you again about this so Paul went out from their midst but some men joined him and believed among whom were also Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So note, in this passage, Paul, he's sharing the gospel, okay? And he has shared, uh, he includes the four aspects that we talked about. God, man, Christ's response. So first, he talks about God in verses 24 and 25. He says, God, who ma God made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples made by man. He's not served by human hands as though he needed everything. But he gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. In other words, you know, there was a day when you could kind of assume the God part because most people had at least a basic conception of what the Christian God was, at least here in America. And the fact is, is that just doesn't, that just is not, it's not true anymore. And regardless, it's, it's, it's great and it's always best, I think, to start with God because that places everybody's life in the proper context. You have to show people that their life is part of something bigger than it is because it is. They think that their life is just, they're just going about doing their own thing. But the Bible says that there is a God who rules over all things and who made them for a purpose. What is that 
Uh, what is that purpose? It says, um, verse 27, that they should seek God and feel their way toward him. In other words, they were created by God, which means God owns them and they belong to him. And God has divine rights and privileges, p- privileges on their life. And if they don't uh, serve the purpose for which they were made, then they're wasting it. And they, don't, they, don't, they cannot experience the joy that God has for those who live in his plan and his design. And so you have to lay the context of their life in terms of God. There is a God. He rules and reigns. He's in control over all things. He's placed you in your particular time in history, in your particular place in the world, so that you can know God and seek him. We begin with God. And of course, we also begin with God because he's the one we owe our obligations to. Because there is a God and because he is righteous and because he has a standard to which he holds people accountable, therefore we are accountable to him with our lives. And so we have to explain God. And then next Paul explains, or Paul also includes a discussion about who we are. That is, we are created. Since God is creator and we are created, God automatically has divine right over us and we automatically have creaturely obligations toward him. And we, is, we have been placed and planned by God to be where we were that we might seek him and we were created to know him. So that's, what you, that's, what, that's part of what you share with people. They were made to know God. They were made to seek God. They were made to find him. And what does Paul say? He says, uh, yet he is not actually far from each one of us. That is, if you, if you look for him and you really want to find him, you'll find him. He's not far from you. And so, and it's also clear that Paul later talks about um, Christ coming to judge the world, that we have fallen from God's command and God's plan. And so, and so, we as creatures owe God an obligation that we have not met. And so we are, our fellowship with God has been broken. So God, man, and then Christ. Christ comes to repair then, to reconcile man to God. It says, uh, Paul mentions him saying, that he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is so this is so critical. When you share the gospel, lots of times we like rightly so, we like to talk about the cross and we should. We should talk about the cross. We should talk about how Christ has come to pay the penalty for our sins in order that we might be reconciled to God. But sometimes we forget the most important part, and that's the resurrection. If Jesus Christ stayed in the tomb, his death wouldn't mean anything. And if you read the book of Acts carefully, lots of times when they're proclaiming the gospel, their focus is on the resurrection. Because why? Because the resurrection was the ultimate vindication that Christ is who he said he was. Lots of people in the day of the Romans were crucified. They crucified a lot of people. Only one person rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, his resurrection validated everything he said. It confirmed everything he taught, that he was, in fact, who he said he was. It's not going to be shocking to people that someone was crucified on a cross, but it will be shocking to them that a man rose from the dead. And if a man rises from the dead, you might want to believe what he has to say about God. And so... Don't forget the resurrection. Proclaim the resurrection. Sometimes, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to people, sometimes I might ask them this question. If a man rose from the dead, would you believe what he had to say about God? That's a, that's, that's a good question to ask. And it, it makes them think. We have to, people have been sold a bill of goods that, that when it comes to things about religion and spirituality, that it's just personal, and that it's just kind of pie in the sky. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But Christianity is precisely not that. 
Christianity, we are saying that God has intersected humanity in time and space in a physical human being named Jesus Christ. So you just, and so you need to help people see that because lots of times people have missed that. They just think it's just all just kind of vague spiritual ideas. But you need to help face them with the fact that what Christianity teaches is that there was a man who walked on this earth, that he lived a life without sin, that he was physically killed on a Roman cross, and that he physically bodily rose from the dead, and you have to make a decision concerning what you believe about this man. You can ignore him. You can, you know, the famous thing that C.S. Lewis is often quoted as saying is, is that uh, Jesus is either a liar or a lunatic, or he's Lord. Either he lied about everything he said, or he's insane. He really believed what he thought. He really believed what he said, that he was the Son of God. But obviously, you're insane if you believe that, or he actually rose from the dead, and everything he said about himself was true. The, the, the point is, is that you cannot believe in Je- you cannot be ambivalent towards Jesus. You cannot say, oh, Jesus was a nice guy. He was not just a nice guy. <laughs> He was either a liar or he was insane or he was who he said he was, but he was not just a nice guy. Lots of people like to say Jesus was a nice guy. You just can't believe that. You see, you can't. And so you need to confront people with the fact of the the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And notice what Paul says, that Jesus Christ is coming into the world to judge the world. You know, um, some people say things like, you can't be scared into heaven. I think you can. I think you should. We should be terrified of hell. I'm telling you. It's the last place we should ever want anybody to go. And if Jesus Christ is the only hope for salvation from the punishment that my sins deserve, I want to know about him. And so Paul didn't have a problem with saying, one day Jesus Christ is going to judge the world. And we know that he's going to judge it because he rose from the dead. And, and you have to make a decision concerning this man. So God, man, Christ, and then response. What does Paul say about our response? Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. This is the hard part, because sometimes we can tell people about Christ, myself included, we can be very sheepish sheepish about urging them to believe, about urging them for a response. But I really think this is so important. We must impress upon people's consciences that, look, you have to make a, you know, I'm not trying, you, you, you can't leave this question unanswered. You have to make a decision about the man named Jesus Christ. And to not make a decision is to make a decision. To not respond is to respond. To not say yes is to say no. And that's all there is to it. The example that I've given before is that in the, in, uh, we, don't, we don't know this as much anymore because we don't live in a monarchy. And even the ones who monarchies, the monarchs are just a uh, show. But there was a time when the king ruled. And he could do whatever he wanted. And people understood God's kingship a lot better then too. And, when the, and you've seen the movies, the king walks into the room. And what does everybody do? They bow. They take a knee. Now imagine, back in those days, the king walks into the room and everyone takes a bow, but there's one person who doesn't move. Well, that's like a lot of people today. They will go up to the king and say, I didn't disrespect you, king. I, just, I was just indifferent towards you. I just didn't say anything. I just didn't make a response. To not respond is to respond. To not yield to the Lordship of Christ is to actively rebel and say, you're not my Lord. You cannot be indifferent towards Jesus. So God commands everyone everywhere to repent. He commands everyone everywhere to turn from their sins. And look, 
We have been alienated from God by our sin. Jesus Christ is coming to judge the world, but you don't have to pay for your sins because God has given you an opportunity to receive forgiveness and reconciliation with God if you turn to Christ in repentance and faith. And then God will accept you by grace in his mercy. So, what is the good news that we share? God, man, Christ, response. There is a God who created you, who knows you, who planned precisely in history when you would live, where you would live, so that you might find him and seek him. And we, all of us, have, have looked up to heaven and shaken our fist at God and said, I'm going to do it my way. We're all high-handed rebels against God, but God in his mercy has sent Christ to pay the price of our rebellion on the cross, to conquer the, the penalty that our sins deserve, which is death, by rising from the dead. And now everyone everywhere has to decide what they will do with Jesus Christ. Won't you believe in him? Sharing the evangelism is sharing the good news of Jesus with the lost and urging him to believe. You know, don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. Don't let it freak you out. Just love people. People know when you care. People know when you're trying to just unload something on them. But when you're talking to someone, the, the best tool and the thing that you should always do is just ask a lot of questions. Talk to them, get to know them, get to know who they are, and then, and then just, try to, just try to probe a little bit about what, what they believe about spiritual things. Ask them, do they go to church? Ask them, do they believe in God? Ask them if they... Uh, the problem is here is that a lot of people will say they're a Christian. You, you have to probe a little bit. You know, ask them. Ask them about, you know, their life. Ask them how their life has changed. Ask them this. Ask them if they're sure. That gets a lot of people. Ask them, if you died right now, are you, do you have any doubt that you would go to heaven or, do you, or are you not sure? Lots of people who know they're not living for the Lord but call themselves a Christian, they'll say, man, I, I'm not sure. That's, your, that's, that's it. You can go right in and say, look, Bible says we can know. And we should know if we are the Lord and if we are Christ and Christ is ours. The most important thing to do in all of this is to pray. Is to pray. If we pray, God will hear and God will answer. And God will give us opportunities to share the gospel. Um, <clears throat> when Meg and I lived in Auburn, we, um, you know, we really wanted, you know, as a part of the internship in Auburn, we would, we would go, uh, the staff would go, and we would go and actually share, evangelize on the campus of Auburn University, and we would share the gospel and you know, had, had lots of conversations. But and that was a lot of seed sowing. That was a lot of seed sowing. You know, never really saw any responses, um, but I just trust the Lord that um, he's working. But at the same time, you know, Megan and I prayed that God would just, that God would give us also some relationships. So we should sow the seed broadly, but we should also, I think, ask God for relationships with people who don't know the Lord. That's going to give us a, a longer period of time over which to invest in people because that's oftentimes, you, and then you have more time to adorn the gospel with your words. You have more time to show people that you care, and that makes the word you proclaim more powerful to them. Well, God in his mercy granted us uh, a friendship with a woman that Meg and I love very deeply and who's just, you know, we love her so much. She's so grumpy 
and we just love her so much. And, and she's grumpy because she doesn't know the Lord. And she had a very hard life. And her entire life, she's told us, she never felt like anyone loved her. And she's over 80 years old. And um, just the fact that we would take time and talk to her, she would listen to anything that we said. And she would argue back, too. (laughs) But she would listen. And and we shared the gospel with her. We pleaded her to to be saved. As far as we know, she hasn't received Christ. But I can see it. I could see her softening to the gospel. And I just pray, I just pray, Lord willing, and we're we're hoping to be able to see her again, that the Lord will get through. She's, her mind, her mind is going, dementia is, her mind's going. But she had a caretaker, her daughter, named Anne, and Anne's not a believer either. And she saw the time that we were willing to spend with her mother, and she's a good friend of ours too. And she just texted Meg, and she wants, she, uh, they want to come visit us. Three hours drive here in Auburn, they want to come see us. Um, the point is this. We didn't manufacture that, you know. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a lot in common with grumpy 80-year-old ladies, you know. I, I'm not necessarily drawn to them. Exactly. I'm not exactly drawn to them. But when you pray and ask the Lord, he's going to, take, he's going to, take, he's going to open doors. He's going to bring people your way. And who knows that you might be just the person that that person needs to t- tell them about Jesus. Especially, I know, created, placed by God then and there to tell that person about Jesus. And so, we pray for opportunities to share, for wisdom to see them, and for courage to take them. And look, this is a journey. It's all a journey, you know. It's a journey for all of us. Um, it's hard, and, um, and so when we talk about evangelism... Lots of times, people just feel the guilt heaping on, look, look, we're just loving people, we're just talking to people. I know, I know people, I'm thinking of a man right now, I won't say his name. You talk to him, you start talking to him, first thing he does, whip out his phone. You, have, you, have, you ever seen a, have you ever seen a beautiful little grandbaby? Let me show you one. He starts tapping on it and shows, he has no problem, no problem. Why? Because he loves his granddaughter. And it's important to him. And he thinks about her all the time. Well, if Jesus Christ is important to you, and you revolve your life around him, and you think about him all the time, look, they'll forgive you. Sometimes you're just going to talk about what's important to you. They'll forgive you. You can bring it up. It's okay. And um, you know what? They might just appreciate it. They might just, they might just, They might just say to you, hear me now, they might just say, you know what, I've been thinking about that. And there you go, the Lord has been working. So pray for opportunities to share, wisdom to 